thank you for tuning in to the Catch a Lift Funds Coach's Corner podcast. We hope you enjoy today's episode and will consider supporting the Catch a Lift Fund and the veterans we serve. Visit our website for more information about our programs at catchaliftfund.org. If you are experiencing a mental health crisis or suicidal thoughts, please call 988 or the Veterans Crisis Line 988, followed immediately by the number one. The views and opinions expressed during the Coach's Corner podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of the Catch a Lift Fund. The Catch a Lift Fund does not verify or warrant the truth or accuracy of statements made during the podcast and statements therein are not to be construed as an official policy or position of the catch a lift Fund. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only, and nothing herein should be construed as health, medical, or other professional advice. The Coach's Corner is a place for veterans to connect, heal, and share their stories. I'm Melissa Luke, the host of the Coach's Corner podcast. I am a U.S. Army Iraq War veteran coach and program director for the catch a lift fund the coach's corner is sponsored by id technologies welcome to this week's episode of the coach's corner we've got another great episode for you today with u.s army veteran and cal veteran athlete mark caning welcome to this week's episode of the coach's corner mark welcome to the show hey welcome Uh, thank you for having me i'm very honored to be a part of this week's episode well, we're so excited to talk to you today, Mark. Let's jump right into it. What led you to join the Army at the age of 23? Uh, it was a um, low in jobs turnover at the time, I guess, for me. Um, just had our first day. She was pregnant with our second child, and we were looking for jobs with really good benefits for you know children and ourselves Um, i had applied for the local corrections department and they were taking a really long time to get me a class date but the army was like hey we can get you gone pretty soon so uh just like okay where do i sign and ended up with a little bit of extra money after basic with the with the you know the bonus at the time in 2009 that's that's pretty much what pushed us in the military direction what mos did you join up with mark uh probably one that doesn't give you much of an option after the service so i was 11 bravo infantry so it was jack of jack of all trades a master of none <laughs> what do you remember most about training up as a young infantryman uh the countless hours of being on the range and out in the field being amongst your buddies in the wildernesses of fort campbell at the time or you know fort benning when i was in basic uh a lot of sand from fort benning (laughs) yeah (laughs) so that's that's the biggest biggest memories i have is just you know Training up is getting to connect with, you know, a bunch of group, a group of people from all walks of life, an experience that you would rarely get outside of an organization like, you know, like military. For sure. Mark, how long would it be until you would go on to deploy to Afghanistan? Uh, After basic training, it was six months, six months when we were, we were gone. You had a pretty quick, pretty quick turnaround to head over. Yeah. And that's what they told me is when I I got my unit assignment, um, they were like, you're going to be gone pretty quick. Uh, yeah. These guys are getting ready to leave. When I got to the union, unit, they had just done one uh, JR, JRTC rotation uh, in Fort Polk, and they were just coming back. So we would go again right before we left that fall and then we'd be gone 
in February of 2010. What was that train up like to head over to Afghanistan? It was a uh, go, go, go. Uh, yeah. We were out in the field a lot, shot a lot of rounds downrange, <laughs> you know. Um, other than that, it was a lot of sweat and a lot of being tired, a lot, <laughs> you know, nothing, nothing that compares to civilian life these days yeah. is right. being out in the wilderness with your buddies. When you talk to us about your deployment to Afghanistan, you describe the first part of that deployment as hearts and mind. What did this look like for you and, and your unit's mission at the time, Mark? Yeah. Uh, so what it looked like for us is once we got on ground in Afghanistan, it was just a lot of uh, meetings between our uh, LT and the village leaders around us, you know, just trying to develop that rapport and seeing basically what the U.S. military could do for the villagers okay. to provide them a safe environment from Taliban and to do whatever possible to keep the fighting between us and the Taliban out of their villages, okay. um, to minimize the risk to, you know, the women, the children, even just people just not wanting to be a part of it, you know, just right. trying to live their life on a regular daily basis, uh, farming, you know, gathering water and stuff at the local uh, creeks and wadis. Uh, just trying to keep all that conflict away from them was, was the big part of the mission when we first started, when we got into Afghanistan. How would that change as your deployment went on? Um, so yeah, that, that changed about midway through when at the time President Obama announced that there was going to be a surge into Afghanistan of troops okay. and influx of personnel on the ground to try to end the conflict as quickly and swiftly, you know, quickly yeah. as possible. Uh, so that, that changed from, that sent us to another AO, uh, of the area. So we were up in Eastern Paktika. We ended up going to uh, Southern Providence of Afghanistan where they were taken, where there was a lot of fighting going on. So they, uh, and driving down route one took days and because of all the conflict going on. Um, but it, that was, that was a super influx of personnel that came in to the AOs, uh, not to mention the mission got even tougher because we were gone out patrolling, um, trying to seek and destroy the enemy as, as much as possible to drive them, drive them from their hiding and out of the area to gain control of where we needed the strategic control points to be. What was that shift like mentally, Mark, to go, you know, that first part of the deployment where it is, you know, a, kind of a hearts and minds mission. And um, then all of a sudden, you know, midway through that surge happens and it's just radically different now, you know, and you're there to root out Taliban. What was that mental shift like? Yeah. So it was, <clears throat> It was uh, more or less, you know, a mental shift was like, you know, these, how can I help these people to be friends and, and with us while shifting to the mentality is like, I got to find these bad guys and keep them from hurting my buddies and us yeah. and anybody that comes in and out of these innocent people's homes at the same time. So it was, it was, became more mentally taxing with the influx of fighting and trying to keep them out of the villages at the same time. Did you guys kind of know, Mark, and just to, to back up here a minute, you know, so kind of that first half of the deployment, 
did you have any inkling that that was going to change, that there was going to be this big surge push through Afghanistan kind of midway through that year, or did it just kind of one day, this is, this is what's going to happen? We had an idea that it was coming, but okay. we didn't know that uh, at the time that we were literally going to pick up from where we were at within two weeks and totally move out of the area that we had been operating in and going to a complete new AO without the right seat, left seat, right. They were just boom, dumping us in. And there like, you are. Here, yeah. Here, here's, here's your mission at hand. This is what we need you to do. And this is how it's going to work. That's pretty much where <laughs> we got dumped. And, and that in itself was mentally taxing because once you get to an area and you're comfortable you know what I mean? You start developing your own little routine and your own little ways of coping with being away from your family and everything else and able to communicate on a regular basis with that routine to, I'll talk to you when I can talk to you. I'll yeah. see you when I see you. Mark, you know, you told us about, you know, and you just mentioned it too, you know, these extended periods of time outside the wire, you know, a lot more uh, patrols like that. And you mentioned, you know, one time being out there 45 days at a crack. Uh, talk about this time for you and your team. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> it was it was exhausting. Um, taking baths with baby wipes and, you know, it, just trying to close and destroy with your enemy that's in this village and not hurt villagers at the same time. Yeah. It, and then being mentally and physically exhausted, uh, people just starting to get frustrated with each other because they feel like each other's not pulling their way on certain duties and trying to keep the team as a whole. And it's rough. It gets rough. Yeah. Um, and then you have guys that are married with kids or versus single guys that don't have that, um, you know, guys just starting to miss home, miss talking to their right. kids, their families, and everything else like that. So we we were eventually able to get a hold of a, a sat phone that we were able to at least make one phone call in that that period of time after we were out for a while. So that kind of helped with the morale. But other than that, was, you know, we were getting airdrops of baby wipes and MREs in the middle of nowhere and <laughs> sleeping on the ground and yeah. At one point, we ended up uh, paying a villager for their whole compound so we could have a place that we could actually sleep with some walls around us. So it was that helped some too. What was that like for you, Mark? You know, having a family back home. Uh, it was rough. Um, you know, you with a young one. You know, you miss a lot of first. Um, yeah, especially. Being out of contact, you know, first word, you know, first steps, uh, first real foods, you know, that kind of things. You you miss a lot of that. Um, so you start mentally planning and preparing. You know, how am I going to make this up? Like, because yeah. you don't, you don't, you don't get time back. The only thing right. you do is make the best of what you miss uh, and try to build up brand new awesome memories that kind of overwrite where you weren't there. So it was a lot of planning and trying to figure out what my next steps would be for the, all the first that I'd missed the birthdays yeah. and everything else that we had missed while we were gone. What would that be like, Mark, coming back home from Afghanistan, back to the States, back to your family? Um, it, it was a shock, uh, you, you know, mentally doing the transition from a high intense, a high end, you know, uh, stressful environment yeah. to trying to let your guard down, but not sure if you can. Um, then trying to be the loving and caring parent that you want to be. Yeah. You know, that you would picture in your mind, this is how I'm going to be while you're trying to fight your own demons and waging that war within yourself at home. Uh, it 
it gets it was a struggle you know it was it's been a big struggle what things kind of helped you through that period mark uh friends and family uh you know um having one or two guys that you know that was there with you and knowing the struggle that you both have been through and what you both are going through um is huge but having family that understands that you have a struggle when you wake up every day is yeah. also huge you know what i mean um, and you know everybody's experience varies uh, everybody's struggles varies so one person's the way they handle the way they struggle is different from another's yeah and just trying to instill compassion upon yourself and have an empathy for yourself and empathy for others that, you know, they have to deal with you at your lowest than you try not to be is, it was, was huge, a huge breaker breakthrough for me is just learning to be like, Hey, you, it's okay to be not okay. Yeah. What do you think it was that, that helped you come to that realization? It took a long time to get there, but, and the reason that I talk so highly of catch a lift and the coaches, it's because it, two years ago is when I got there, yeah. when I came and got involved with catch a lift and, uh, Don Wright, you know, having that friend that I could, t I knew that I was going to yeah. talk to every week about everything going on and the struggles of the nutrition, even though it was nutrition and the struggles of life, you know, yeah, you know, he was, he was there and it didn't matter if I needed anything, I could email, call him. He would, he would answer as soon as he could, you know what I mean? And yeah. so I'm very grateful for catch a lift fun and what it has done for myself, uh, my family, uh, you know, I built, I got new gym equipment from Catch a Lift uh, a week ago and I got it built. And the first thing my boys was like, when are we going to work out, Dad? Let's go work out. Oh, I love like, it. All right, let's yeah. go do it. So, I mean, we were able to bond through, you know, physical activity and physical health and wellness. And along with nutritional health and wellness has been huge for all of us. And I am deeply grateful and I can't say enough about the program and what you guys do for veterans on a daily basis. How did you find Catch a Lift, Mark? Um, I believe it was, I can't remember exactly, but I believe it was scrolling through something on Facebook. I think okay. somebody mentioned it on Facebook. I was like, oh, I'm going to check it out. And I got to looking at it. I got to read more about it. And I'm like, hmm, I'm going to think about it. I'm going to apply. I, I think I might apply. But do I need it? And come to find out I needed it more than I realized I did. Yeah. You know, and and that's the one thing. To anybody that's listening out there, you're like, if you think you may slightly need the program, then you need the program. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um. Talk to us a little bit more about, about your fitness, Mark. Um, how do you stay active? What do you like to do with the equipment that you have? So I, I just got the, a squat rack, a new bench, and everything else, uh, a lat attachment for it. Nice. So that's going to be a huge transformation over the next few weeks for me. That's awesome. Uh, but my brother-in-law had donated a treadmill that sits at 10 feet from my desk now in my office. So it makes mobility easier, even in the seasonal changes of Kentucky right. that it has here. Um, but the bands uh, that Don got sent to me, uh, I still use those, especially for stretching. Um, and then I refer to all the material back to all the material when I'm looking for a new dinner to cook and it's like, Oh, yeah. Don has a good recipe. I'm going to go back and look at my email. 
How and, have you, I was going to say to Mark, if, if you touch on, you know, so coach Don, he's, he's absolutely tremendous and so much knowledge. Uh, how has the nutritional, you know, the nutritional implementations that he's, he's helped you create in your life. How has that positively affect you? Uh, a lot. <laughs> it really has. Um, and I didn't realize how much, you know, until I got into the sessions with Don, how much gut health, how much your gut health plays an effect and everything else as far as your, even your mental wellness. Yeah. When I started fixing gut health and implementing the changes that Coach Don recommended, I could physically see a change within myself, but I also mentally felt that change as well. You know what I mean? It's uh, yeah. you see all these commercials about probiotics being change life changing, and but learning about the pre pre probiotic and the and all that stuff. Uh, he has a wealth of knowledge that I, yeah, he does, and it's it's like nutritional Wikipedia. <laughs> it, it is literally yes <laughs> so there's not a question that i don't think he would actually not know the answer to yeah and it yeah it was a he is a tremendous asset anybody that's looking to fix their nutrition i highly recommend coach don like he, yeah the friendship that he can bring to the table but not not to mention the wealth of knowledge on nutritional aspects of life and and the fact is, he's like, I'm not telling you not to do anything. It's just, you know, add this, tweak this, yeah. and you'll tell the difference. And he's not, it's not like you're trying to starve yourself, uh, you know, because yeah. I've I tried multiple things, you know, keto, paleo, and you always feel like you're starving. He's like, no. Yeah. Add a smoothie. Like, wait, I can have that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Here's how you make it. <laughs> so, oh, <my laughs> Yeah, that's that's tremendous too. And for anybody listening, uh, definitely jump on to um, the landing zone. Get in the nutrition section. There's a lot of recipes on there that that Coach Don made for our athletes. Uh, he's written articles on nutrition that are up on the LZ. Uh, yeah, Don's incredible. Anytime I have the pleasure to email with him or talk with him on the phone, I never leave uh, without learning many new things, not just one new thing. <laughs> yeah. Or and you won't leave the phone without a smile on your face. Either. Yeah, and it, you know what I mean. It's he's a great guy. I can't. Yeah, I can't. He is. I cannot speak highly enough for him. He's such a great asset to anybody's life. Yeah, it, you know, just having access to um, a person like that is life changing within itself. Yeah, absolutely. I want to shift gears here just a little bit with you, Mark. Okay. So, and I'm, I know, you know, within the veteran community, you've seen this too, Mark, but really there's a common thread of, for so many of us, right? Post-service. And it's, it's really seeking purpose again, trying to, you know, find our place again, trying to find that purpose post-service. Um, you would go on and you would eventually, you know, go back to school using voc rehab and studying software engineering. Talk to us about that journey. Yeah. So, you know, I had my youngest daughter, obviously a uh, post post service, um, about 15 months after she was born, we found out that she was autistic. Uh, and about the 15 month transitional period, is most is the most ways the autistic special needs community kind of describes the change okay. within a child. So they would have normal development up until about 15 months. And it was about 15 months that we noticed a change within her that she started to progress backwards. Okay. So she was starting to say words, and then all of a sudden she was not saying words. Her fine motor skills kind of declined at the time as well. And then as her life through therapies uh, progressed, we found out that, you know, she's just going to be kind of nonverbal for a while. 
Um, so that led to a lot of research and things like uh, the PEC system where they use pictures to make sentences and talk. Well, you know, obviously we became in a decade that technology was rolling the world kind of like yeah. you could reach out and now you have a, a wealth of knowledge within the palm of your hand. And somebody had mentioned some, an app, um, it's called Prolo go to the Prolo to go app. And what it is, is a virtual pec pec system. She can flip through all that, find what she was saying, find what she wanted to say and put sentences together using pictures and words. So, and then it would, she could tap the, the bar at the top and it would actually talk for her. But the problem back then was it was so expensive. Okay. For, you know, a family of six, even then, you know, I didn't have a very good job to say, you know, I'm still trying to find purpose, trying to find something that drives me. And <clears throat> I was like, man, why is this so expensive and yeah. fighting with the insurance companies and seeing what the health insurance companies would offer your child is far less than what they deserve and what we right. think they would deserve as parents. Right. <clears throat> so I, I thought long and hard about it and I was like, what if I go to school to learn how to write software and then try to bridge the gap between high price software and the special needs community that I absolutely need it. Right. And so that that's what led me to starting that journey down the software engineering path is I want to be able to bridge that gap for low income families with special needs children that absolutely need a form of communication. That's absolutely incredible. So that's, yeah, that's how my journey with software engineering began. <laughs> what did that schooling look like for it, Mark? Uh, try learning a language on steroids. So you're learning multiple different ways. Uh, and then you're learning the languages on like foreign languages and not just one of them, but three of them at a time, you know, just for the front facing of a website, you're looking at three different languages, if not more than that. And then on top of that, you're learning algorithms and math at the same time. So it was, it was a wake up call, you know and I mean? And I understand now what developers at Google go through, developers at Microsoft go through yeah. the, the whole life cycle. Like when we get them annoying updates on our phone, it says, uh, we patched this and that. I'm like, okay, I understand what. <laughs> you know what, you actually know what that means. Yeah, I understand what that means. And I know that the bug that they're fixing wasn't necessarily caught right away and nor did they intend to release a bug that somebody else just exploited for evil. You know, so I understand the, what they're running through right now in the back scenes, working 24 hours, a day, having crews work 24 hours a day to try to solve that problem. But yeah, that's mainly I wanted to solve a problem. And that's the problem between the health insurance companies offering a far less than needed materials yeah. with for special needs community and what they actually could use. The usability of this app is great. And it took her no time to figure it out. But the price point, the price point is yeah. really high, but I understand because it takes a lot of hours and a lot of work to develop a product like that. But if I can do it on my own in my spare time and still keep the affordability, the price down for the parents and low income, then that's what I'm going to do. 
It's absolutely incredible. Thank you, Mark, for your service to our great country, but also thank you for this continued service that you continue to give to so many. That's absolutely tremendous. When you started down this path, you know, with the software engineering and once you were kind of in it or even, you know, maybe in the early stages of it, were you intimidated by it? Because it sounds, oh, yeah. to me, I mean, it sounds so damn intimidating. <laughs> how, did you, how did you get through that? Um, the, the first place that I started to learn it was a place in Louisville, Kentucky called Code Louisville. It was an initiative that President Obama brought to the state of Kentucky to help bridge the gap at the time between people needing work that would absolutely pay their bills and they would be able to live off of. Um, But they had such great mentors in this program that I probably would have quit 90 times over if it wasn't for the mentors. Like, no, it's easy. You can get this. You know what I'm saying? And their approach their approach to learning it and how everybody learns differently and the products that you can put out during your portfolio and within your portfolio and what your learning ability is, is vastly different. But the concepts that they graded on was whether or not you knew the concepts. So I've never been a designer. I don't have the designer eye. If you give me something, I can build it, but it may not be what you were thinking about all the paints and colors and stuff like that. Uh, But I can build the overall structure. You know what I'm saying? And that's, that's where I knew that I could build it, but I would still have to put a team in place to design it. You know what I mean? With industry experts, you know, knowing what, the accessibility laws and the best practices are is comes in it's totally different learning curve than just writing the software to build the the wireframe structure how long was your schooling mark uh it's still not over i'm not over there's so much to learn within software and the first, the first three languages didn't take anything, any time to learn. Uh, you know, the basic HTML, CSS, um, and JavaScript doesn't take much to learn once you start getting in that. And then you got, you open a floodgate to many more languages and many more things that they do with different things. So, learning process in software engineering is never over. It's an adventure. <laughs> It sounds like it. Yeah. What but, would you yeah. say to talk to, talk to, you know, veterans specifically that are listening um, that, you know, even if they feel, you know, maybe intimidated by this or this is something they've thought about doing, what would be your advice to them or where do they start, Mark? Uh, just find the basics. Uh, there's free programs out there that you can get involved with that will absolutely teach you the basics and, prepare you to be ready for any time of any time you want to go further than the basics. Uh, I use, I still use freecodecamp.org a lot. Um, but the veterans out there listening, if you want to get in software engineering, treat it like your military service, be committed and don't give up and don't, don't let it overcome you. And make sure you reach out and lean on somebody for help because there is, for every person out there trying to get into the field, there's many more people trying to help mentor those getting into the field. Mark, talk to us about your experience with Voc Rehab. Uh, Yeah, so I didn't know what it was until I got my service connected. rating and I got a pamphlet in the mail about it saying that you can continue your schooling under a different program. Um, But what I didn't know was the way it works is if you use 
your chapter 31 benefits first it takes away from voc rehab but if you use voc rehab first it does not take away from your chapter 31 benefits so keep that in mind if you're coming out and you're wanting to go to school and you have a service connection uh rating use the voc rehab first and then you would still have all your post 9 11 benefits after the fact that's incredible but, yeah that's 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 a good tip to know with it yeah, so I, when I got out, I was making holsters out of plastic, and I was like, you know what, I'll go to, I'll use this post nine eleven GI Bill to go to school for business, and got my associates in business, and then the Madison, my youngest, was born, and that happened, and I was out of, I was out of benefits, right. And yeah. I was like, well, I want to go back to school. And, of course, I found the pamphlet about uh, voc rehab. Uh, and it all depends. Your experience with the program will vary, just like anything in the military related services or community. Is it all very... Um, right. It just depends on your counselor and the day that they're having. Uh, my first counselor got me so many extensions for the program to be able to continue my education as far as I needed to take it and as far as they could possibly extend it. So extensions are definitely possible. Don't let them tell you that they're not, but you know, it's solely up to your counselor, but don't, don't let one counselor deter you. Yeah. Find you one that works for you. I mean, their job is to work for you. Yeah. I, I think that's pretty solid advice too. Just kind of, you know, with the with the VA in general, right? Whether you're talking about it on uh, the healthcare side or like folk rehab, you know, um, don't let one person or one period of time, or maybe you had a bad experience there, you know, turn you yeah, bad on the whole thing. For sure. And um, one of my guests on one of my episodes uh, told me this, and it's kind of just stuck in my head. Uh, the VA healthcare system is the wish. The VA healthcare system is the wish.com of healthcare. So, and and I say that, but I also do not want to take away from right. the frontline workers within the VA because there is a ton of them that are tremendous oh, heroes in our yes. book and do a lot. But just like anything, there's a lot of bureaucracy up at the top. And that is a lot of bad names for a lot of organizations that uh, we definitely, as veterans needing the service, should not hold against anybody that is yeah. direct facing, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you just, you just mentioned it here, Mark, and I want to ask uh, you about it. So you've created a podcast for other veterans. Talk to us about your show. Uh, yeah, so... It had always been a brainchild of mine, but never, never took any action. Um, I got a message one night that a previous senior NCO uh, of my company passed away, and it was believed that it could have possibly been a suicidal moment that he was having that um, the healthcare system failed him on. And that kind of was a kick in the butt that I needed um, to get it started. So my purpose and mission, and I just brought on a co-host that has the same purpose and mission in life, and that's the help other veterans and potentially others outside of the veteran community to bridge the gap between, you know, the services that are provided and organizations like catch a lift that provide to the people that need them most that don't know about them. Um, so that brings up a good point. I need to get you on mine. So oh, we absolutely. Can talk about catch a lift and all the great, and we can just talk about how awesome it is for the veterans and uh, oh, absolutely, anytime. And uh, yeah, so we're trying to bridge the gap between much needed services and organizations that provide them and veterans, and 
people out there don't know about them. Um, my new co-host is a uh, student. He's a veteran. He was an army veteran, but he is in studies for mental health. So <clears throat> I figured that will help a lot. Yeah. That helped bridge the gap because there's a lot a lot of us out there that are just too bad, too bad and bold that don't need to talk about our mental health struggles until it's too late. And yeah. I want us... There's studies that have been released by independent colleges that say because the government doesn't rule overdoses and substance abuse as suicides, that if they did, then we would be looking somewhere in the 40s and 50s veterans per day. And we as a community need to come together and try to stop that. With yeah. One is too many, but yeah. if we look at it, as a big picture, we're looking at close to the uppers of 50 a day, and that's that's way too many. Yeah, I mean, it's it's incredibly staggering to think about, right? Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think it's absolutely incredible that you created that podcast, right, with that, with that mission to help, you know, kind of bridge this gap. Um, you know, just kind of on a personal level, Mark, what else do you think we can be doing like as veterans, you know, members of this community? Um, what can we be doing to bring that down? Uh, we need to look in the mirror um, and we need to take that hard, difficult look. Uh, in this service, you know, we relied on the people to the left and right of us. And just because service is ended uh, doesn't mean that that reliability is ended either. You're not, you're not alone. There's hundreds of thousands of veterans out there every day that are pushing through struggles that may just need an ear to talk to. Um, you know, um, just reach out. Uh, it may have been five years since you've talked to an old teammate or a battle buddy or somebody that you served with. Who cares? Just reach out, yeah. check on them because they may need that. You know what I mean? That that day, the day that you reach out and talk to them may have been their last day to walk this earth, and you could have saved their life just reaching out, and saying, "Hey, man, just checking on you, um, just letting you know you're not alone. Love you. Anything, yeah. holler at me." You know that that very well could save another person's life it could keep them from looking for answers in the bottom yeah. of a bottle right or at the end of a needle and that's what we need to do uh we need to take ownership and leadership of this it's an you know it's an epidemic yeah. uh, right now for for the veteran community for sure and then it expands you know what i mean you got first responders that deal with this stuff in right. country yes. on a daily basis yes. and everything else um just reach out. Uh, it doesn't matter. Just reach out. I'm like, hey, how are you doing? And, yeah. you know, the biggest lie that we tell ourselves is we're fine, right? That's we always, we're always fine, right? Yeah. We're always but fine. That's that's the biggest lie we tell yeah. ourselves and everybody else is we're fine because we compartment, we're used to compartmental, compartmentalizing every aspect of military service in life that we just forget how to talk to others and people, you know what I mean? And we need to, we need to grow past that uh, stigma and take a really hard look at ourselves in the mirror and see where, yeah. where I personally need to grow uh, to get past this. And what do I need to do to help myself? But more importantly, what do I need to do to help, you know, my battle buddy or, yeah you know, his family or whatnot. Um, the last thing I want to ever do again is get another message or another phone call that a friend or somebody that looked out right. for me during my military service has taken their life because, you know, we didn't check on each other enough. So we, we definitely know, right, that there's an incredible both feeling and, and actuality isolation within the veteran community. And, you know, it's interesting because while we all have individual stories, individual things we went through, we have a, so many 
common ties to one another within our community. What do you think it is, Mark, that that drives this feeling of isolation, the actuality of the, you know, that the feeling that we're the only one, we're the only one that's dealing with this thing, you know, and then not to reach out to other people <clears throat> in these times. That people don't understand. Um, that's, that's a huge one. And it was a huge one for me. You know what I mean? It's like, how do I describe the battle that I have going in, going on upstairs that, in a way that people would understand and understand that, you know, even though that it may not be a suicidal thought that folks have, but there's still a raging war yeah, going on, you know, upstairs and just talk, just open your mouth and let the words flow. People may not understand, but it will help you lift a ton of bricks off your chest. I guarantee it. There is so many programs out there that will, if you don't have anybody to talk to, yeah. that will openly just sit down and talk with you. I can guarantee, I can almost guarantee you without a doubt that any single veteran would sit down with a cup of coffee and hang out and talk to you for hours. Um, you know, and Almost every coach within Catch a Lift will do the same for you. Yep. And would appreciate if you did the same for them. You know, my yep. my phone numbers, all my phone's always on. My DMs on Discord, Twitch, wherever you can find me is always open. Um, I have no problem sitting on the phone with you and talking for people to people yeah. for hours. I, I talked to one veteran a couple of weeks ago. For almost six hours, just uh, help him cope and work through some problems that he was working through. And I've never met this fellow in my life, face to face in my life. Yeah. It's yep. It's just a common bond that we guys, yes. we all have shared as you know, in military service is, and we know what we, each other goes through. You know, is we can't always depend on fighting this battle alone you didn't fight in the war alone you're not you didn't go through military service alone right you, you know, yes you always had somebody there to either hand you give you a hand with a, a task or you know you depended on many other people to commit a, to complete a mission and mission success so that doesn't change once you leave you still have for sure a huge community that you can rely on and guarantee your mission success of continuing life and bettering yourself and within life. Thank you for talking on that, Mark. Oh, no problem. That's it's a topic that I have become very, very passionate about yeah. and it, you know, it's near and dear to my heart. Um, yeah. So I could talk about it for hours. <laughs> so. Yeah. Mark, what's the name of your podcast? Uh, it's the Rock Talk Podcast. Um, and it's R-A-K-K, -K, talk, uh, all one word. And we're on all the major music and podcasting platforms. Um, I'm getting ready to drop episode two as soon as we end. Wonderful. Uh, so... And we pretty well keep it unscripted and let it flow, especially for any of the veterans that we bring on. Um, and it and it does two things, and the mission accomplishes two. This the keeping it this way has accomplished two things. It lets the veteran talk about what's on his mind and his heart, and get has an audience to talk to about. And it lets the community members know the that you know it's a safe place, if you will, for these veterans. Right. And it also lets them know more what we have been through, the struggles that we go through, the ways that we cope, you know, because if you know a veteran and you hear what other veterans are going through and maybe it'll help you save that veteran's life that we have not been able to reach yet. 
Wonderful. Well, we'll make sure that we have the link to the show down uh, in the YouTube description and in the show notes and everything. So everybody check out Mark's show. Thank you. Uh, Thank that's, that's so awesome. You're doing that. I do have one last question for you today, Mark. Okay. What, what does being a catch lift veteran athlete mean to you? It means the world. Um, I kind of get a little emotional talking about it um, because, you know, when I found you guys, I was in a dark spot. Yeah. You know, I thought I was going through the world. I was fighting the, the battle here at home alone. And <clears throat> you guys show me I'm not, um, you know, through, you know, the just the nutrition coaching alone. Like I said, I owe Don a lot, um, yeah. a lot. He is uh, truly an asset, um, a lifelong friend um, now. Um, but it means the world that I'm a part of a program that has dedicated so much resources to fellow veterans after the family that started the program suffered a traumatic yeah. loss. You know, their way to give back to the community that, you know, their family member is served in yeah. is is huge. Um, to find purpose after traumatic loss is also, you know, just tremendously admirable um, to put other things in front of their own fight is huge. And I could not be any more prouder and thankful than I am to Catch a Lift Fund and everybody that it puts forth in the, the chat rooms and the community rooms that are so positive if you're having a bad day, you can post in there like, ah, I didn't push as hard as I should have this week. And, like, and, they, and they'll be like, oh, it's fine. You, you know, you got tomorrow. Yeah. And <clears throat> one of the, one of the things that, you know, within Catch Lift that I also has changed my, changed my life is, you know, it got me sober. You know, that's. That's tremendous. Congratulations. Thank you. And, you know, and it's, it was just that, you know, one more, you know, one more day, one more rep, one yeah. more, you know, one, just the power of one is yeah. huge. And you can look up the power of one. It's all over TikTok, Facebook, everything else. But it's, you know, just if you're struggling, just give it one more day. If you're thinking about drinking, stay sober one more day. And if you feel feeling weak in the gym, just push out one more rep. Yeah. One more mile, one more step on the treadmill. It's just, you got this. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mark, we're, we're so honored to have you part of the Catch Lift family. Thank you so much for coming on today and speaking openly with us. It was truly a pleasure. Uh, pleasure is all mine. I really appreciate you guys having me on and uh, me being able to tell my story and what you guys mean to me. And you always have a place in my heart. And if anybody out there is listening and needs somebody to talk to, you can find me very easily on social media. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of Coach's Corner. We're always so grateful to have the opportunity to connect with our members and heal through the stories of our veterans. A special thank you to our guest today, Mark, for sharing his story and his life light with us all today. It was absolutely terrific. Don't forget to join us every Wednesday live at 1 p.m. Eastern on YouTube for a chance to win Cal Swag and a chat with your brothers and sisters. If you liked today's episode, please be sure to like and subscribe on YouTube and leave us a review on your favorite streaming service. Until next week, keep it real and stay Cal strong.